Welcome back, everyone, to the Lobster Roll series. Week four, I'm in your host, Dominic, or Shadow here, whichever you prefer. And we are moving on to the loser's bracket. We will be having a... Oops. We will be having the loser's bracket matches. And they will be starting with Ted McFred and Stuart98 on Fallendell. So, Stuart98 is, to me, the favorite to win here. But we'll see how this goes. They haven't fought Ted McFred yet. Ted McFred going for tanks, as is typical. Stuart going for amp bots, which is... We saw go to go for that last time. I mean, that's what took out Steel Blue. See how all that works out, though. I mean, could actually... Actually, I might be in such an advantageous position. Duck missiles home. So, I mean, the thing is, like, two ducks are a little bit cheaper than one Kodachi, but the missile's home, and the Kodachi's, like, 700 HP. Ducks have, what, 30, on 30 damage per... Uh, I think the ducks are going to have a disadvantage here. I mean, archers still exist, though, so, you know, just go with archers and kill things that way. That works, too. Why is the game music not... Oh, it's just really low. There we go. Anyway, from that, though, Kodachi's, yeah, one duck versus Kodachi, not great. I will, I do expect Kodachi's are going to be nerfed after this tournament series. I don't expect they're going to be nerfed during the series, because usually pre-tournament nerfs happen by accident, but mid-tournament nerfs, I don't, well, okay, usually it's one-day tournaments, so this is the first time I've had a weekly series. But yeah, this is definitely... Kodachi's definitely a very strong unit. Possibly a little overtuned. And I feel like even if they have counters, those counters are just harder to use than simply more Kodachi's, which is what we saw last week. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I wanted to see what was going to happen with Kodachi's on maps that weren't Cobalt and Red Comet. That weren't, like, the flat maps, the flat, highly spread out maps. But these more hilly or at least rampy clustered maps. And what we're seeing is that, at least for Fallendale, which still is still somewhat flat, but nowhere near as much as Red Comet or Cobalt Dream, Kodachis are still very strong. Like, Kodachis are still, a, are still a force to be reckoned with. And yeah, I think they might be overtuned. We'll see how archers do, though. I mean, archers are about the same cost, so we gotta be, it's one-to-one. One. And archers, that's... 133 DPS compared to Kodachi's, well, hard to say, but 80 DPS there. So Archers might be Kodachi's. Oh, beat them by range, that's for sure. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, Archers absolutely be Kodachi's. Never mind. Sheesh, if that Archer wasn't half dead, that Kodachi would have been able to do nothing. Stuart 98 also taking advantage of the fact that they are putting a lot of pressure back onto Ted. Expanding all over the north side of the map. The south side has been somewhat seeded, but the north side, no, that's completely free. And again, archers beat Kodachis. Although that that was a little bit of a harder situation. But still, archers outrange Kodachis. Archers out damage Kodachis. Archers out cost Kodachis slightly, but still. And that is not a free metal extractor. That might be a free welder, though. Oh, that welder is so close. Yeah, there it goes. Welder down. Metal extractor down, but more important, welder down. That'll slow down the expansion a decent amount. Archer's forced to retreat, but hey. Did the trick. Amphbot might be something we start seeing against tanks, though. I think we're going to see some ogres pretty soon. We're going to see some blitzes right away. But against archers, yeah, I mean, blitzes are 300, archers are 200. That's three archers per two blitzes. Well, that's the that's the real question, you know? Because one archer per blitz is going to be probably blitz advantage. They're roughly the same unit class, and blitzes are more expensive. But two? Or three to two? Well, we've seen that very shortly. Stuart 98 coming in here and just getting their defenses well set up. Half a dozen archers will be going out here over to the south to take out everything that Ted McFred has built. And the north side, there's nothing defending it. 
Blitz coming along here, taking out a few metal extractors, or at least threatening to take out a few metal extractors. Damaged Blitz, mind you, so this archer will have an easier time. Assuming the Blitz chooses to engage, which it really shouldn't. It's taking too much damage already, trying to take out the metal extractor. Same time, though, south side of the map, we have the archers engaging and unfortunately taking a lot of damage to the lotuses. I mean, they are kind of slow. But still, forcing Ted McFred to retreat. Same time, Blitz is coming to the north. <laughs> Ted McFred taking full advantage of line of sight mechanics, but unfortunately not full enough, losing that after killing the metal extractor. A clever move, but unfortunately incomplete. Same time, though, Stuart just wiping the floor with Ted McFred's bases. South side of the map has been opened up completely. Now it's just two-thirds of the map belongs to Stewart 98 At least soft control. Ted McFred. Oh, beautiful. Taking advantage of the archer range. And Ted McFred is pretty well lost in the south side. North side is reasonably well fortified. There isn't a way that an archer or two could get in there. It would take a larger army. Same time, though, blitzes over to the south are not really presenting a huge threat. Again, the lotuses are the real problem. They stop archers dead in their tracks. Just due to archer speed being so low. But yeah, if Ted McFred has to move into Stuart's forces, the archers are an amazing choice to get rid of them. Although, admittedly, it's an amazing choice if they aren't spread out and being killed one at a time. That That is a huge part of it. Do you have a Grizzly coming in here? Ah, uh, nope, nope, nope. Good switch. Good switch. Switch off to Scallops. Grizzly's not going to be up in time. The Scallops will at least help get rid of the Blitzes coming in. There we go. One down. The Archer coming for extra support. Actually, that is amazing. That is a metal donation and a half. Stuart's got to be loving this. And that is... What is that? 1,500 metal total? No. 720 total. Yeah, 556, 556 over here, and then another 80 around here, another you know, 120 up there. Yeah. That was really good for St Stuart. Ted McFred, on the other hand, struggling a little bit with trying to build up enough units. I really am surprised they haven't switched off to Ogres. Ogres would do an amazing job getting rid of the Archers. Minotaurs might also help just for being able to outdamage them. I would also be useful against Scallops, but yeah, this is... Like, honestly, the bigger problem to me here is that Ted McFred has the faster army and is moving straight into Stuart's slow defenses. Trying to overtake Stuart's slower army by running into it. Finally getting the right idea. Goes for the commander who is otherwise undefended. And that will take them out. The Stuart losing their commander, that's... That is their entire north side defenses. That was the thing that was keeping the north side alive. So that opens things up for Ted McFred. But those direct assaults, those were not wise. Stuart able to use the reclaim to start just rebuilding their forces, no problem. And as it stands, Stuart is still kind of in this awkward position where they're trying to get some damage done, and they're not really able to get damage done, but they're also not dying. They're, but they are losing some from attrition. Ted McFred is starting to win on attrition. The Blitzes are doing work. More than I'd expected. But again, a lot of that is because now it's Stuart advancing into Ted McFred. And Ted McFred's earlier mistake was advancing to Stuart with units that were not as well bunched up against units that were very well organized. Or at least once they got into Stuart's base. In the, in the middle of the field, they were poorly organized. And seriously, Stuart, you do have radar, right? Not nearly enough. Ted McFred, on the other hand, also doesn't really have radar. Why don't people scout? Build radar. It's super important. Like, if you don't know what your opponents are doing, especially when you have the fa or the slower army, actually, the faster army can respond. If you have the slower army, you absolutely have to know what your opponents are doing, or at least have some idea of their troop movements. I don't understand why people don't just build another radar tower here or there, like... Yeah, it's a couple hundred metal, but it's worth it. No, 55 metal. Sorry, my bad. Sparrows are 235. But radar is nothing. 
Like, Stuart would have been able to save the north side and their commander if they had radar over the north and seen that Ted McFred was going over there. Or at least would have been able to save the north side expansions. But they have no idea until the attack is happening. Like, they just can't react. Now, that's giving Ted McFred a lot of room to get in this and turn this around. But I was mentioning before that Ted McFred needs to attack from the side, he needs to flank and do damage that way, not go for a, a central attack, is exactly what Ted McFred is doing, and it's completely ruining Stuart 98's economy. Not a whole lot Stuart 98 can do, because again, Stuart has this slower army. I mean, Stuart does have a grizzly going into Ted McFred's base, and they do have the blitzes surrounded. But even then, the blitz is still able to escape. At least a few of them. Now, granted, Ted McFred needs to retreat, partly because the Grizzly is here, and partly because they've got a lot of damaged Blitzes that didn't have to die. Like, they really didn't have to die. Are this Grizzly coming in here? That is... Uh, that's a lot of metal being thrown in. Blitz is able to put a complete stop to that, along with the Ogres, so if you're wondering why Ogre Atostic, that's why. It's a very high damage unit. Like, it is it is a part skirmisher. But yeah, I don't understand why the lack of radar coverage. Like, I, it's not that... I can see people not going for Sparrows. Because Sparrows are 230 metal, and that's... Especially early game, that is a good three or four raiders. But... Well, two or three raiders. But in... In the late game, it doesn't make sense not to. And... Radar? At 55 metal a pop? What? Why aren't you building that? That's a like one raider, and it's it, it's worth the lives of a dozen. At any rate, Teddy Fred is totally turning this game around, having been able to get rid of the first Grizzly, and now, again, going for these flank assaults. Stuart 98 having been forced into a very slow army that's, again, completely unaware of where Ted McFred is, and so can't really group up where they need to, is unable to respond. Ted McFred just wiping out units as they come in one at a time and destroying everything that Stuart 98 has built. I mean, fortunately for Stuart 98, they're still reasonably okay on attrition and reasonably okay on their economy for now. But Ted McFred, they've got they've got their heavier units being built up. I mean. One or two good Minotaurs would completely just seal this. I don't see that happening. Kingstad pointing out in chat that Minotaurs aren't really how Tempic Red plays. Also, I mean, maybe building a pad if you want to go over heavy Konachi or Blitz. Like, build a pad for those and then use the main factory for Minotaurs or, Cy or Cyclopses or something. At any rate... Unfortunately, I mean, also build more caretakers. I don't know. Ted McFred... Ted McFred is doing really well in terms of unit composition. They are having some issues in terms of their economy, and I think Stuart 98 can take advantage of that. Because Stuart 98 lost a lot in those raids. They lost a lot of metal extractors. They lost a ton of energy production. They were forced to cede a fair amount of territory for a little while. But they have taken out the forces. Slowly but surely, Ted McFred has lost their army to attrition. And more importantly, this entire time, Stuart 98 has been able to use all of the metal they've been able to reclaim and all the metal they've been able to gather. Ted McFred, on the other hand, while they've been reclaiming a bunch of this grizzly, have been accessing. They only have 40 metal per second going into the factory. They got some construction going up around the map that's eating the rest of it, but they were accessing for a long time. This grizzly was nowhere near as disastrous, or grizzly wreck was nowhere near as disastrous for... Wait a sec. Oh! They're not reclaiming it. They're resurrecting it. So it hasn't actually done anything yet. Interesting. But still, yeah, as I was saying, Ted McFred basically, regardless of the wreck, I mean, they just, Stuart 98 hasn't been that far behind. Because this is... This has just been a better production setup for Stuart 98. And now they have two armies. They can easily set up a defensive front against the Blitzes coming into the north. And they can easily set up their main assault force over to the south. Start wiping out everything Ted McFred has built up there. 
I mean, they're on a bit of a clock because of the Grizzly Resurrection. Another... Ooh, not very long. Ten seconds, maybe. Same time, the Blitz is once again dealing tons of damage and nothing really in the way to stop them. But they have a limpet to slow them down. So that is still something. And again, though, that is... Several more Blitzes dead. Grizzly has been revived, though. It is up. Ted McFred has resurrected the Grizzly. One Grizzly versus two with a bunch of Blitzes, and we saw already how Blitzes are very strong against Grizzlies. And that another Grizzly is going to be yet another Grizzly turned over to Ted McFred. And as fortunately, Stuart 98 having lost, more importantly, the Caretakers. They lost a bunch of Medlic Tracks, but the Caretakers lost for that Blitz raid. That is huge. Stuart 98 now accessing, and Ted McFred now enjoying the advantage of production. Still, though, there's one Grizzly coming in here, at least stopping the raid. Why aren't you going for the Ogre? That is weird. Like, the Ogre is what's killing you. Whatever, one Grizzly probably not going to be that much. But at the same time, Stuart 98 with a giant force, and now Ted McFred, someone locked down to that Grizzly. Well, then again, though, they do have a reasonable army size. I mean, they lost a lot of the, to the blitzes they sent in, but again, that's still a lot. Oh, wait a sec. Oh, wait a sec. Oh, hello, backyard gin. Oh, this is going to be interesting. So we have a frontline force coming in here that Stuart 98 probably is going to win on. But just in case, a gin exists over here in the bottom left side of the map. I'm gonna get some bulkheads over, drop them in, or teleport them in with a gin. Or maybe. Hello? You gonna you gonna use the gin here? Or, or what? Maybe they forgot to set the rally point to the gin. I mean the bulkhead's here to set things up. Or is that bulkhead? The gin's here to set things up, but it's not being used. I don't understand. I think there was a mistake in rally points. Because if that gin got used, that would be perfect. That'd be huge, but unfortunately it's going to get spotted before it's even able to teleport in. Or, it would have gotten spotted if the Grizzly had gone far back enough. But still, reinforcements would be a lot easier to send in if they were using the teleporter that had been painstakingly set up. I don't understand why this isn't being done. There we go. Okay, rally points just weren't set properly. Well, at any rate, Stuart 98 does have a... I mean, does have the south side completely taken for themselves. Going for air factory switch. I don't think they have the they don't have the metal for that. Like they gotta rebuild their metal extractors. That's the first priority. Rebuild the metal extractors, maybe take the south side metal extractors and build more energy, like rebuild their economy. That is huge. More blitz is coming in to try to take out whatever was taken before, but yeah, this match is really really kind of falling apart. Like neither player really rebuilding what they have, and that means neither player is really able to get the advantage after any attack. Because Stuart 98 had time to rebuild. And Ted McFred certainly has time to rebuild now. Go for the resurrect instead of the reclaim. That is. I don't know, it's debatable. I'm not really sure how well that works out, honestly, because the I don't really see you don't see resurrect that often. A rare thing to go for. But at any rate, Bliss is coming in. They will be able to see the Jin Beacon. Prob yeah, they see the Jin Beacon. They know there's teleporting. That there are teleporting shenanigans that could be happening. But they are losing a lot of potential to actually respond to that. However, this raid force over by Stewart means that Ted McCred is the opening to take the center take out this entire force, there's nothing stopping them. What's that Blitz even shooting at? Yeah, nothing stopping them, and the lamp isn't going to be useful at all. In fact, I'm not even sure if these Blitzes are, aren't just going to win the game outright. They are already coming in. The plate is basically dead. The main factory could go down soon after. I don't see Stuart 98's forces over to the north having anywhere near the same luck as what's coming here for Ted McFred, who should be able to take this, and that, I think, is going to be game. The factory has gone down. 
Stewart gonna go for a base trade. That is their only hope right now. Get a base trade. Win from there. After getting rid of the Ogre and Blitz. But even then, I'm not sure, because they have the Grizzly over here from Ted McFred having resurrected. It's damaged, but it's doing a lot to get rid of all the support forces that Stewart's Grizzly has. Bulkhead going for the fusion plant. Good choice. We'll see if it's done quickly enough. Grizzly coming in to defend. Ah, but the Blitz is going behind. They know their target. They know what they need to do. The Grizzly is down. The Bulkhead is going down. The fusion reactor is going to live. It's going to live. Ted McFred. Brilliant defense there. And actually, nice job taking some of the expansions over to the north that Stewart didn't take back. Stewart going for the Thunderbird, but they have no army to really support it with. Honestly, why are they going this way? Oh, right, because defense. Yeah, that makes sense. No, seriously, why are they going this way? There's nothing to defend here anymore. It's dead. The only thing to do is just teleport off the gin and try to go for a backyard assault. That's the best way they could defend is by pressuring Ted McFred to actually defending their own base. Yeah, I, I think Stuart 98 has just lost a lot of their nerve. They've, I think they're getting tired because it's just going back and forth. They've been defending stuff and it's been falling apart. They've been trying to deal with actually taking out the forces as they come in and it's just not working and they've gone for their own counter raids and it simply got stuffed. There's really not much more to say for that. Besides, Stewart's desperately trying to rebuild, but they have no money to rebuild with. And the Blitzes don't have any support forces to actually come in and... Or rather, the Thunderbirds don't have any support forces to kill the Blitzes with. So that's looking really desperate right now. But again, both players have just been making a lot of mistakes, unfortunately. Like, Stuart 98 could have rebuilt more earlier on. Ted McFred has taken advantage of that, and now it's just a matter of they've got Stuart surrounded. Stuart finally getting the, the jump off factory built, and thanks to the Thunderbird, it's harder for Ted McFred to actually do anything. But it's also not really mattering. It's just Stuart 98 can't rebuild from here, cannot easily get stuff back. And a lot of times earlier in this game where I've said that it all came down to whether or not you know, following an army getting killed, something was useful. But now it's not even that is relevant. Like, even if, even if this army goes down, we've got this... Okay, maybe a bit of an overestimate in Etten's, but we have support forces from Ted McFred and Stuart has nothing. This Grizzly is it. That, Grizz that Thunderbird and Grizzly are it. I mean, I think it, I think maybe Stewart could have taken it with, like, much earlier on. I mean, had they either gone for something around the back lines, maybe, or gone for something, or actually, no, had radar. That was the thing. Had radar, spotted the blitzes, so if the blitzes didn't come in through the north side here, then Stuart would have been able to keep their base. But unfortunately, Stuart did not get any radar and had no idea the Blitzes were coming in. They have some... That's Ted, my bad. They didn't get any radar. They had no idea what was going on. And as a result, they ended up losing way more economy than they had to. Because prior to that, I mean, Stuart had a massive advantage on metal income. And metal income, energy income was better for Ted McFred, but they were going for a res build anyway. But yeah, Stuart had a really good position for metal usage and then lost everything. You see, their economy just got tanked because Blitzes came in. First Blitz Raid, second Blitz Raid. Stuart was able to rebuild after the first one, but not able to defend, because again, they had no radar. They had no way of knowing what was happening, and they have a slower force. You absolutely have to have more information if your force is slower, because you have to put it in defense position well in advance of your opponent's assault. But that's how it goes when you are, I guess, relying a bit too much on intuition and not enough on actual scouting. So with that, we are going to be moving on to the loser semifinals, the Gominon versus Stuart98. Or sorry, not Stuart98, Ted McFred. Congratulations, Ted McFred. Yeah. 
I thought Stuart 98 would win, but no, Ted McFred has really shown themselves to be quite a strong player. Anyway. So yeah, Legomenon versus Ted McFred. That is our next match, and that is going to be the loser semifinals. Which... I am, like I said, kind of impressed that it's gone that way. So yeah. We're in the second half of the bracket now. But yeah, Duck, I don't know. I think Archers were a good choice against Kodachis. I think Duck is a reasonably okay choice. Blitzes do cause problems, but yeah, I think Duck would help. Yeah, but you didn't rebuild the radar, Stuart. Stuart in chat pointing out that they didn't... They're not sure how Amph beats Blitz and that they had a radar, but it's like, yeah, it got destroyed and you didn't rebuild it. That's the point. Also, yeah, King's chat pointing out the Limpet. Like, that is a thing. Again, this is something the campaign teaches very early, which I think is a great lesson the campaign teaches. I don't know if it teaches any other good lessons. I haven't played that far into it. But what I have played into, one of the earliest levels, you have to go Imp Glaive against vehicles. Well, you have to go against vehicles as Cloaky, and Imp Glaive is the suggested thing to do. And Imp Glaive, Limpet, Duck, Roaches kind of work on their own. But yeah, those... Those suicide bomb units are really effective, especially against well against vehicles, because vehicles are quite expensive, so you don't have to actually stun or slow very many of them to get value. And when you're dealing with tanks, that goes double. Like that's always the thing you gotta think of. That's that's a tough thing to think about, but it's a very important element of the game is how much metal are you spending on your units relative to your opponents? Because if you're spending Know, half as much metal as your opponent and you're losing your army well you were spending half as much metal as your opponent yeah the right unit counters you can get away with it but if you're running like raider versus raider if you are spending half the money you could spend more metal on the units and still break even or still be in a position where you're ahead because you're spending it on units that are countering. Yeah, it's 160 a pop or 200 a pop, but against units that are 180 or 300 a pop, makes sense. It's all worth it. Okay, Stuart, the limpets in your main base saved you. When you tried the two limpets, I mean, granted, at that point, the blitzes are already inside of and behind your, like, inside of your main base, behind your solo collectors. It's really hard to hit them in the first place, but the limpets did save you. And then for, yeah, in general, oh, Duck, again, has the homing weapons. And Limpet slows them down, so the homing weapons are even more effective. I don't know. I'm, I'm noticing this tournament, there's a lot, there are a lot of habits that people have developed about trying to minimize the amount of unit types that they use per factory. And that's something which... I don't know. It's clearly limiting the matchup understanding. I mean, I get it. it. There's a lot going on. It's complicated. But again, this is something where if you're not playing it around the idea that you had the whole factory, and this is something I've, I still not great at personally, but, you know, the whole factory is important. And if the units in the factory... There's some probably some combination that deals with matchups. We saw earlier with the with Mad, Madcraft going entirely cloaky or sorry entirely imp and Ronin sorry imp bleh, they got imp they would have been fine Glaive and Ronin we saw it now with being just Archer Archer Grizzly and Archer Grizzly is like the thing to do with Amph bots, which is why we see it because it's the thing that people do is the Amph bot thing. But yeah, it's like it's this. The game, it, it's a bit more complicated than just the thing, even though sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Anyhow. Gah. 
That commentary aside, we are on to the next match, on to the winner semifinals. It is going to be Legomenon versus Ted McFred, Ships versus Ships. Because we're on Izuki Channel, pretty much the one C map of the entire tournament. Legomenon going a bit heavier on the early cutters. Well, Ted McFred going for the early, early hunter and possibly into... No, just early hunter. Not bothering with Corsairs yet. Sorry, Cutter Hunter for Legomenon. Both players going for scouting rating. Nothing too special. Although Legomenon seems to have been a little bit behind when it came to their economy construction. Like, the Mariner's up faster for Ted McFred. Hmm. Same time, Legomenon is going to be a little bit better suited to scouting or possibly even raiding out Ted McFred's expansions. Already coming in here, there is a hunter trying to find a way to get in and deal some damage, but no, Legomenon doesn't want that to happen. Intercepting it after this one little island. And that will be a dead hunter. Or at least a hunter forced to retreat. Trying to find some way in here to get past the Gominon, but I don't... Yeah, no, it's going to work. Never mind. The Gominon decided to go away from there. Cutter will come in and deal some damage, but not without the cost of his own life. At the very least, I like this. Ted McFred getting some good scouting, and it took some effort. But they did manage to get the scouting in. He got a lot of scouting in. They have already... Wow, seriously? Man, Legomenon already e-stalling a little bit just because of that. Urgent able to stop the assault, but that's a lot of information that Ted McFred just got there. They know the entirety of Legomenon's setup. They know where Legomenon's some of the defenses are. They've obviously got an idea of at least possible approach paths. Like This is, this is pretty good. I mean, it's... Legomenon hasn't done anything super out of the ordinary. But it was still it's still good to know. So thank you for scouting. But maybe don't lose your Mariner needlessly going too far up front. Again, Legomenon does still have a lot more pressure applied than Ted McFred does. Ted McFred hasn't really gotten... They can use Corsairs. They haven't gotten any Corsairs. They've gotten some Hunters. That's about it. I mean, Ted McFred doesn't really have an army. They're gambling really hard on fast economy, which this map does not support. This is not a feast map. Like, they're not going to be able to pull it off. It, th three Mariners is more than enough. Four Mariners, actually. Four Mariners is more than enough. So yeah, Ted McFred needs to be a little more concerned about getting forces to actually deal with their opponents. And unfortunately, they're just going Hunter, Mariner on repeat. And that is not helping. So, Hunter Mariner. Not the best composition. Sea Wolves are coming in, however, to respond. But at the same time, we have Hunter Mistral. Hunter Mistral Corsair! Legomenon not even going for any more, any more workers. Any more Mariners. They are good. And, yeah, they have... Now, they could use one more, maybe, but... That's fine. One Mariner right now on a map like this? That works. This map does not support super explosive expansion. Legomenon right now looking extremely strong. Three Hunters, or four Hunters, a couple Cutters for support. Seawolf Corsair coming in from behind against three Seawolves. Three Seawolves, and they're just supporting Mariners over to the northeast. I mean, Ted McFred, they do have... They have the Seawolves coming in. I mean, with the Caretaker, they've got a bit more to work with. And, of course, they are getting more Metal Extractors. Their economy is a bit stronger. Like 29 to 21 Metal per second. Yeah, that's pretty significant. Unfortunately, the army is not there. Legomenon, if they attacked right now, they'd win. Straight up, they would win. All of... All of 
Temmic Fred's defense forces are out of position. Temmic Fred themselves doesn't have a whole lot of defenses in their base. These units wipe the floor. That that would be it. They, they'll be done. The Gomenon, however, I don't think they realize this. They do have radar coverage, a reasonable amount of Temmic Fred's base. I don't think they quite realize just how open things are. I mean, they might have, having seen the Seabulls over to the northeast, might realize, hey, wait a sec, Temmic Fred's got to have their forces there and not here. And, ooh, Corsair getting some damage here. Hunter able to save the day. Hunter and Urchin, as Legomenon is encroaching on Tendmik Fred's territory. Hunters should just be able to come in and take this out completely. I mean, that is a lot of Hunter Seawolves, on the other hand, going the other way around. Getting rid of the Mariner that was the only Mariner Legomenon had. If the Seawolves keep it kept... Okay, there we go. I was going to say, if they kept attacking, they'd be in a good position. Bit of a base race going on, though. Seawolves over in, in the main base, getting taken out by the Hunters. Fortunately, this is pure Seawolf. Seawolf Corsair would have a really good time here, but pure Seawolf does not. Siren coming in, completely wiping the floor with the Seawolves that were in the base. Legomenon has nothing to worry about anymore, while Ted McFred on the ropes. They have nothing to deal with mass units on the surface. They I mean, Corsairs would help. Mistrals would help against the Sirens as well. But again, Ted McFred not really in their comfort zone. I was pointing out, people in chat are pointing out, because Ted McFred is a tank specialist. And they're not playing tanks right now. They're playing on a water map. I'm surprised they didn't ban Iski Channel, honestly. They had the option, but no, they didn't they didn't say no Iski Channel. And now with the sirens coming in, there's not a whole lot to stop them. And although Technic Fred has been able to build up a reasonably strong economy, just a reasonably robust economy, it's just not turning out to be enough. At least not in terms of the units they're switching to. Hunters wouldn't be able to deal with the Corsairs, though. The Mistrals... I mean, the submarines would get rid of them. So that is something, although one of the Mistrals already just taken out this Mariner. Because it can. There's nothing stopping it. Ooh. Oh, actually, well, there is. There's just the fact that the Hunter is here. And more importantly, the Metal Extractor was in the way. So nice job defending there, Tim McFred. But unfortunately, that area is completely cut off. Legomenon's got loads of urchins in the way. So Ted McFred is going to be losing that southeast section, or southwest section in the northeast. Not much hope. Not all that much hope. For all their mariners, Ted McFred is not rebuilding this area quickly, or reclaiming. They do still have mariners, right? No, they moved all of them over here. That's right. They wanted to build 50 metal per second on these expansions instead of leaving at least one at home to deal with everything that's gone wrong if there's any battles or rebuilding or anything. Well, still, I mean, the Corsair is doing a reasonably okay job. But again, it's just the, the Mariners could be at home reclaiming. Oh, there's so much reclaim. A new Mariner... No, no Mariners are being built. And all the Mariners that were built are dead. There's nothing. There's... Temic Fred has no builders at all. They desperately need Mariners, and I don't think they realize that. I'm oh, sorry, they have one. They have exactly one. Got away. Stays alive. But why are you not going for the reclaim? I mean, I get Temic Fred liked using the Lazarus device beforehand, but reclaim is more important here. Reclaim is your friend. Use the reclaim. If Tem Friend has the reclaim to work with, at least they have an economic advantage they can actually take advantage of these four caretakers with. Especially as they are going to be losing the stuff that's been built off the side. But no, the last Mariner does go down. Tem Fred finally is heading out to rebuild metal extractors, but again, there's so much in the way of reclaim here. 800 metal worth of reclaim. That's like, at least three ships. That's four Corsairs. Actually, three Corsairs. It's 768, but whatever. That's three Corsairs. That's... That is a lot. Okay. Oh, no. It's reclaiming just the one. Why are you not reclaiming? I don't understand what... I suppose more understand, like, why reclaiming this stuff isn't priority one. I mean, Legomenon, they've got caretakers out here that will be reclaiming very shortly. 
thing they were reclaiming earlier. Whereas Tad McFred, they have the commander right here. It's rebuilding, which is not bad. It's just not what you need. Well, to be fair, Legomenon might be losing their commander pretty soon. Yeah, Siren here, plus with the Sea Wolves. Commander goes down. Blockade should be destroyed pretty quickly. That opens up the southwest once again to Ted McFred. So that does at least put them in a decent position, but... Now, their economic advantage from the northeast is the only thing really working for them, and that has been pretty well destroyed. I mean, these Sirens are going to come in here now that the Urchins are dead, thanks to the Envoys, and it's going to be a death. And I don't understand why Ted McFred is not reclaiming. Be like 40 metal per second for a good good minute and a half. Be able to fully use the production for a good minute and a half, and then actually even further because they store some of that. Uh, at this point, just kind of moving the sirens into really awkward positions that are not doing them any favors. Seals trying to come in here, and the Courser will go down, but the Sirens are going to get rid of their counterpart on Ted McFred's side. Well, let's be fair, actually. That, ooh, that... That little island! Oh, that saved Siren's life. How about that? No, Ted McFred's not going to reclaim. They have nothing in queue to reclaim. There we go! Finally getting a Mariner. Hopefully that's used for the reclaim. Keep harping on that, but it's like, no! Go for the reclaim! It's your one chance to be able, able to build up enough units to actually take this all back. Well, to be fair, the Seawolves are doing pretty good work. I'm like, not going to lie, the Seawolves are actually... They're really putting in work. I mean, they're going to get destroyed by these Urchins, but... Well, they had a good run. And cut a swath through all of the Gominon's forces. We finally getting reclaimed. We're finally getting reclaimed. Ted McCraig going for the reclaim. All right. Actually, now at this point, I'd say use the Mariner to assist build the factory. But yeah, finally getting some reclaim going. Use the Mariners to assist build. Assist build the factory. You don't need more power right now. You got plenty of that. Assist build the factory so we don't have any metal excess. I don't know why I keep going on this stuff. It's like. Pretty basic stuff, but it is it is the key thing that's putting Ted McFred at, I mean, at a worse disadvantage than they already are at. But if they have a theoretical chance of getting back in this game, they just need to be very smart about how they use their reclaim and how they turn that into production. And unfortunately, having lost their Northeast expansion, they aren't doing great on metal. And also, unfortunately, this reclaim here is kind of out of the way, and that is 1,500 or so. So, unfortunately, having... They, they waited too long in the reclaim. And they waited way too long in the reclaim. Like, with early reclaim, this army could have been... Or the army earlier could have been twice the size and taken out a lot more of Legomenon's army. Meaning Legomenon would not have been able to come in with four sirens and an envoy and just completely wreck everything. Ted McFred now is just desperately trying to build units, but they're coming in one at a time and getting destroyed. And they've lost the reclaim fields that were there. There's so much reclaim over by Ted McFred's base that Ted McFred cannot take. And I'm surprised Legomenon isn't taking either. Like, Legomenon here, they, they, they don't have any Mariners. Or so they have the one. It's like, there's so much reclaim. This is where you'd want three Mariners just coming in together. And then that's, you know... An extra 20 metal per second. Three re three of them coming around here, eating all this stuff. 20 metal per second for a good few minutes. I mean, Legomenon's at an advantage, but there's no reason not to get a bigger advantage. <laughs> Kingstad pointing out, I don't think that Ted McFred is used to having skirmishes available in their factory. Well, I mean, to be fair, they don't do much besides Coda Blitz, so... Probably not used to having... A factory where you're expected to use more units than just the raider and scout. Probably figure, you know, you just use those, but I mean, they got into sirens reasonably okay, but yeah, they haven't built a single mistral, which they kind of counter sirens. And that's. And again, it's just been a bit weird as far as the way that either reclaim or construction has gone. Now, three more sirens sunk. Legomenon should be able to completely put this to bed. There is nothing left. Ted McFred has got nothing going for them. 
Continuing to build Siren after Siren, continuing to lose Siren after Siren. And Legomenon has taken the entire rest of the map. Still hasn't reclaimed very much. But they had the Metal Extractors and everything else, so they got that going for them, if nothing else. Oh, they are going for Reclaim. Okay, they're finally getting some Reclaim going. Again, though, they could have way more Reclaim. Like, just build a Mariner. Build a second Mariner. Even that's just 15 metal per second already. Plus whatever you have before. That's 40 total. But at this point, Legomenon... It's the game to lose. Like, Ted McFred has got nothing going for them. Legomenon bearing down in that last factory, and it looks like Ted McFred is just going to throw in the towel. I think once the caretakers are down, Ted McFred's got nothing. Actually, I'm kind of surprised that this isn't... Are these caretakers actually building? No, they're repairing the shipyard. That's what's going on. I was wondering, like, how are they getting metal when they only have 17 per second? It's like, because the factory is being repaired. The units aren't being built faster. Yeah, Ted McFred, they are done. I'm afraid the factory is out. Fusion Black is out. Commander's gone over to try to build an air factory in the corner, but... Yeah, that's not happening. Ted McFred simply doesn't have the resources, or soon won't have the resources to actually support that. In fact, how the heck do they even have 10 metal per second? Oh, overdrive. That's how. And there's the Lico getting rid of the commander. Spots the airplane factory. I uh, should be seeing some ravens come over there pretty soon. And we don't yet. We will soon, though. Ooh, nice. Ooh, very nice Phoenix drop. Only one wind generator might survive? I think this will survive. Nope, it's dead. Very nice, Phoenix. And there it is. Ooh. Ravens come in. Hacks like it's sort of one, but it's not enough. Tepic Fred's commander is down. The airplane factory is also down. Oh, never mind. That's the envoy. And there it is. Ted McFred has been eliminated. Legomenon will move on to the losers' finals. Although, I've got to say, congratulations, Ted McFred, for getting fourth place. That is very impressive. Like, that is still saying a lot. So, good job. And I hope to see you next week. For now, though, we are going to be moving on to the losers' final, losers' finals, which are going to be between Steel Blue and Legomenon. I don't know how that's going to work out because Steel Blue, Steel Blue would be my favorite to win, but at the same time, I don't know. I mean, Legomenon's kind of. They're kind of killing it. They're doing a really good job there. So, with that, we just have Steel Blue coming in here. Needs to get this all set up. And then... Alright, the Gominon's already taken out Frosty Cove. Right, the Gominon gets first pan. Oops. Nah, I don't want. No, 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 no. We're not doing an intro. We're not doing an intro. Don't have a hockey for the map screen. That screwed me up. So yeah, we have the setup for the maps that are available. They get banned back and forth. So far, Frosty Cove and Iski have been taken out. I expect we'll probably be down to Baron or Fallendale. That's been kind of how this has been working out. We saw one Frosty Cove, saw an Iski, saw an Intersection, so it's reasonably even. I just would be surprised if Mercurial was played. Mecha and Sonia, I would also be surprised if it's played. But I would be surprised if Baron was played again. Yeah, I'm thinking Legomenon probably wants something a little bit less macro-focused. So I probably would want Baron or Intersection. And Steel Blue probably want the opposite. So Mercurial or Fallendell or Mecha and Sonia would be better for them. Frosty Cove would also be better for them, but yeah. Sorry, so sorry, that water map ban was Iski Channel was banned by Ted. As a joke. That was not actually a ban. So we currently only have Frosty Cove banned.
and intersections out as well. Aiski is out for real. Okay, Lugamanon took that out. Probably didn't want to have to deal with that again. Steel Blue doesn't want Mechan and Sonya. I don't know if anyone does, honestly. Lugamanon getting rid of Mercurial, somewhat surprisingly. I thought it would work okay for them. Oh, Fallen does that. So we're on to Baron once again. Wow, okay. I guess Baron's just the least unfavorite map around all this stuff. Which kind of makes sense. It's a bit of a smaller map, so it supports a lower macro oriented style of play which is better for the weaker player and it's also still a map that has a lot of stuff going on in terms of how you can you know if you know the map better i guess or no it doesn't really support macro at all i don't know the stronger player i guess they can hit faster but that's about it So to that end, we have we have the map, we have the players, we have just waiting on the factory picks. Steel blue for the jump bots, Agamemnon for cloaky bots. It's about to say cloaky bots, but then, nah, it's not gonna be cloaky versus jump again, is it? It's like yes. Yes, it absolutely is. That is exactly what's going to happen. Steel Blue. Again, Jump Pots. Early Puppy. And it's kind of unsurprising. Legomenon, on the other hand, early couple Glaives. Going for a bit of scouting, maybe a bit of raiding. Legomenon knows what they're doing! They have taken the plus 1.8 first, which I know sounds really basic, but it... That's the thing with Baron. You've got to understand this map does not have symmetric metal extractors. They are not all the same um, same value. They are wildly different. There's, I think, half a dozen decent ones on either side and then a bunch of plus ones. Yeah, it's... It is a famine map to end all famine maps. And that glaive did nothing. Now, the second one was on defense. Well, okay, it didn't do nothing... It spotted the fact that pyros, or sorry, that puppies are a thing, and so jump bots are a thing. And good to know for Legomenon. They know they have to deal with puppies. Or with jump bots, period. Queens, puppies, moderators, pyros. Legomenon being very aggressive on this one. Steel Blue, on the other hand, are they going for a straight commander rush? Got yeah, the commander upgrading. They're pushing forward pretty fast. Maybe they are. Play is coming around the side. Steel Blue's commander does spot them on radar. And Legomenon noticing that. Doesn't want to engage the commander. That would be a very bad move. But then again, the Glaive coming around the back here. That's got this metal extractor's. That's got this metal extractor's name on it. It is going. That metal extractor. Gonna kill off about well most of Steel Blue's economy actually. Legomenon's still expanding. Steel Blue not expanding as quickly because they wanted to go for the really valuable mexes, which yeah, that makes sense. Unfortunately, they didn't defend the valuable mexes they already had well enough. Legomenon as well getting their commander upgrade. And since we are in a smaller map, Legomenon taking advantage of that fact, going for slower units that are more effective at dealing with more heavy units. I mean, the moderator is going to have to be a target of the glaze, but you now Steel Blue's commander is going to be vulnerable more to the more to the Ronin than anything else. Oh, but the oh, that is cool. Oh, that's going to be a thing. Moderator is getting distracted by the drones. That is pretty huge. Ooh, we got his commander with the range. No, it's the rocket launcher, not the range. Using the base rocket launcher range. Yeah, it's not that large, but it's large enough. Yeah, Steel Blue, their hyper-aggression is not working out especially well. Gominon. 
Come in, dealing significant amount of damage on the defense. There's a placeholder coming in to try to put a stop to this, but honestly, I think that Steel Blue, they just don't have the support units needed to actually make this whole thing work. Lagonan looking to take advantage of that, going around the back with a few more glaives to try to find some harassment opportunities. And harassment opportunities there are. Almost all of Steel Blue's economy is completely open. Steel Blue, in fact, forced to retreat to deal with these glaives that are approaching their base, and... That's great and all. But the Gominon, with their commander and the drones, is able to see everything that's happening. Steel Blue is not going to be able to retreat far enough to actually save their moderator, at the very least. Possibly save their commander. Certainly not save their base. The moderator is doing some damage in the main base. Actually, these glaives really shouldn't be approaching the main base. And Steel Blue... They're desperate on this, but Legomenon realizes, hey, there's something there. There's nothing over here. Let's take it over here. And that's that's the right call. Lagana making a lot of great calls this game. Playing this very smart, getting rid of another metal extractor. Putting Steel Blue again into an awkward position where they already are behind. And they aren't really producing a lot relative to Legomenon. Oh yeah, they're not producing anything. They're, their factory is completely dead. They've I guess been focusing entirely on commander upgrades? Hard to say. But anyway, Legomenon's commander. Oof, it should be fine. Steel Blue's commander, however, needs to retreat. Legomenon's commander with another upgrade on the way. Very nice use of the rocket pack to get rid of the moderator and just push Steel Blue's commander out of the way. Steel Blue is expecting a lot of raiders to assault their commander, hence the machine gun. But Legomenon either realized that and went for the Ronin directly, or just thought, well, wait a sec, this is a smaller map, and I'm already dealing with a bunch of, a bunch of heavier units. But the Raider phase is clearly not a thing this game. Let's just move on. Except for, you know, the occasional Glaive coming in here, taking out, so far, a total of 5 metal per second from Steel Blue's economy. While Legomenon has been slowly building up. I mean, very slowly, mind you. But still, they're getting metal extractors here and there that are of reasonable value. And another one's about to be built up. And Legomenon just able to push back yet another moderator. Jumpbot Factory is completely dead. Why is Steel Blue not building stuff here? Getting some puppies up instead. Yeah, that commander is in a tight spot. Oh, drones coming in. Scouting out the commander, spotting for the spotting for the Ronin. And that commander barely able to stay alive. Puppies come in to save the day, but Glaive's are in the northeast, making those puppies essentially useless. Yeah, they're going to kill it. Oh, but it doesn't matter! The commander goes down! Regardless of the puppies. And that is it. Steel Blue throws in the towel. That was the loser's finals. And now Legomenon going up against Gorda in the grand finals. Oh, that is going to be... That is going to be a thing. That's going to be a thing to watch. So yeah, we have... Oh, this is loser's finals. My bad. Sorry. That was Lucy's Finals. The description will have it correct, but yes, I'm sorry, the bottom. I always make one of those screw up. Anyway. So yeah, with that, we have... I did... I'm sorry, I didn't miss... I didn't see the commander entirely die. I thought I was going to survive, thanks to the puppies. My bad. Anyway, we're going to have a small break before the Grand Finals, so stay tuned as we switch off to that. And then we will have Grand Finals, and that'll be it for this week.